yesterday. Um, and uh, there are, there are uh, there's been a f really an enormous amount of work done uh, over the last several years uh, by uh, Venezuelans and by others. Um, and uh, the IDB has clearly a leading role in the recuperation of the Venezuelan economy when we think of um, things like the, the um, electric sector, the energy sector, uh, which are in bad shape. Uh, so he will now be in a position officially to represent Venezuela in those IDB preparations. Um, and that's uh, a lot better than doing it from a university. He'll be inside. Washington. Coming this week from Macaibo, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, the second largest city, sort of the Houston of, of Venezuela, I guess, that had a lot of ransacking and it sounded like a terrible situation. I was wondering if you have any sense of how close the economy is and the infrastructure is in Venezuela to a total collapse and following that, the impact on Maduro. Well, our information is that the situation is considerably worse in Maracaibo than in Caracas in a number of ways. I have not seen uh, lots of looting in Caracas, although the um, blackout and the diminution of uh, social media mean that we may not be seeing everything that's happening, but we have seen it in Maracaibo. Uh, there's been a lot that has been reported uh, in social media um, and to us. Uh, part of this, I think, is because the regime uh, is directing its attention to Caracas. You know, uh, they seem to be uh, taking the view that what happens outside of Caracas is not threatening to them. Uh, so, for example, uh, power supply is better in Caracas than in Maracaibo or anywhere else, actually. Um, so that's, a, I think, a political judgment on the part of the uh, regime. Um, what is the impact of this situation on the longevity of the regime? Um, it's obviously uh, going to shorten the life of the regime. Now, I've said before, we're not making predictions. And as we look back, we see that, generally speaking, um, neither we nor anyone else has been very good at predicting when regimes fall. But uh, this... this um, Blackout has really intensified the difficulties in the country, uh, the difficulties of average families, the difficulties of uh, government institutions. Um, and I think it demonstrates that the longer the regime stays, the worse the economic and social, social situation are going to be. So um, what I'm, you know, I can't give dates, but it seems to me it's obvious that, that um, more and more Venezuelans will be coming to the conclusion that uh, there is no decent future for the country with Maduro in power. Said, thank you. Uh, two quick questions. To the best of your knowledge or your opinion, what is the cause of the blackout? What is the exact cause of the blackout? And second, could you explain to us the article under which Mr. Guaido declared himself president? It is said that it has expired last month. Can yeah. you explain that to us? Yes. What is the um, yeah. On the blackout, we're not there. Um, I believe there is a consensus now um, that by far the most likely explanation <coughs> is that these extremely high voltage lines, um, which tend to uh, bow as the months go and years go by, that is, uh, they are not straight. They tend to um, sag. sag is a good word um, into trees and bushes, and that creates the possibility of a fire. Um, that is what more I would say more experts have given as the explanation. So how do you avoid that? It's simple. Um, you cut and prune and keep uh, trees and bushes from approaching the lines, and they haven't done that. There's really been no maintenance, not just for years, but for decades uh, on those. They have three high-voltage lines coming, essentially, from the Guri Dam. 
That's our best explanation. Uh, it is not formed, obviously, by examination, but rather by reports that we've seen from a fair number of experts. Um, as to the Venezuelan Constitution, uh, the National Assembly has passed a resolution that states that that 30-day period of interim presidency um, will not start ending or counting until the day Nicolas Maduro leaves power. So the 30 days doesn't start now. It starts after Maduro. And they, that, that's a resolution of the National Assembly. Wait, when did they, they did that after he... They did that, this is roughly a month ago. We could we could try to find the date for you. When he was when when he was took the mantle of yes, when, the when, president, that wasn't there. Can that's you, correct. Can you and do so that people, ex post facto? Like when that? people ask the question, that how do like saying, you know, I, I was elected for four years to be president, and then two years in, it's you tough. changed the rules so that your term didn't start, you know, hasn't even started yet. Well. You don't get a vote because you're not in the National Assembly. Um, but we... Does the U.S. view that as constitutional under their system? Yes. I mean, we're taking the... The National Assembly is the only legitimate democratic institution left in Venezuela. Uh, and their interpretation of the Constitution, as you know, is that as of the date of this alleged term for Maduro, the presidency is vacant. Um, but they have also said that that 30-day period starts when Maduro goes. So, so Guaido is the interim president of an interim that doesn't exist yet? <laughs> the 30-day end to his inter interim presidency starts counting uh, because he's not in power. That's the problem. Maduro is still there. So they have decided that they will count that from when he actually uh, is in power and Maduro is gone. Well, I so think it's logical. So then he really isn't interim president. Exactly. He is interim president, but he's not no able to exercise the powers of the office because Maduro still is there. So their interpretation is that until and unless he actually has the power to run the country, he's not actually... No, the interim their, inter their interpretation is that the Constitution requires a 30-day interim period, but it sh those 30 days should not be counted while Maduro is still there exercising the powers of his former office. AFP. Um, have you engaged uh, directly uh, again with countries who still uh, recognize Maduro as president? I think you said last week that you hadn't, haven't spoken with uh, China yet. Have, have you had the chance to? The ambassador has, I believe, been out of town. So, But we have spoken to China in Beijing. That is, the ambassador has spoken to the Chinese government about this. What? Is there something, uh, have some they, progress? Have we, have we changed their position? Not yet. Not yet. Thank you very much. It is reported that uh, North Korean Chairman Kim Jong Un willing to support Maduro regime. Any comment on that? Because uh, it resembled uh, Kim's regime and Maduro regimes. So, any sense of this? Well, we have noted that um, among the 54 countries that support the uh, people of Venezuela and interim President Guaido are uh, many of the most influential democracies in the world. Um, we have really not been trying to get North Korea to support Juan Guaido. That has not been a mission of ours. ABC, two questions on the Americans that remain behind. Um, when we were in Cucuta, you said that there were between 30 and 40,000 U.S. citizens. Some estimates put that as high as 50,000. Do you have an update on the number of American citizens you believe are still there? Uh, and American Airlines announced today that they are canceling commercial flights into Venezuela. Um, as more airlines consider that and, and take that action, is the U.S. considering any sort of evacuations for citizens that remain behind? Um. 
Well, first, we've had a, a travel warning for quite a while. And the travel warning has been one of the strictest, saying to Americans, don't go. Um, obviously, it makes it harder to leave uh, when the largest commercial carrier is no longer serving um, the airport in Caracas. Um, we are trying first to do the consular activities from the State Department, um, and we will have a protecting power. As to the question of, of um, a major threat that would leave lots of Americans to want to leave, um, there, you know, there are always plans to help people leave in a, in a situation of um, uh, danger. Uh, we have those for lots of countries. Um, and um, I think I'll leave it at that. Colombia's president, Ivan Duque, said in a recent interview that he doesn't believe that military intervention by the United States is the right uh, thing for Venezuela. How do you countenance that with the very real implicit and repeated threat that the United States has held out that all options remain on the table? Well, I don't think that... Yep. Just a, a quick follow on that one. Um, have, you, have you identified a protecting power uh, in Caracas for remaining staff? Because I know there was discussion as to identifying one. Um, I'm just going to leave that where it is on the protecting power. That is, we are in discussions. They are reasonably advanced, but they're not done yet, and it will take it will take some more time. I don't see a contradiction contradiction between what President Duque said and what we always say. We also believe that the military uh, outcome is not the right outcome for the future of Venezuela, for the people of Venezuela. A peaceful democratic transition is the right outcome. Um, our policy is a peaceful transition to democracy. Our economic, financial, diplomatic, political pressure is designed to achieve that goal, or better put, to help the Venezuelan people recover their democracy. Um, but there are lots of contingencies and dangers in the world, and therefore all options are on the table. Um, do you know how many Americans you have still in Venezuela, probably number? And then, um, can you explain more the sentence that you say that you have closed the embassy because the situation there has become a constraint for the U.S. policy? What, what do you mean for that? Well, we don't, uh, I'd say first, we don't ever know exactly how many Americans are in any country because, you know, Americans are free to travel. We urge them to register, particularly in a situation like Venezuela, register with the embassy. For one thing, they can get onto an email program or a text program where they get warnings, uh, where the embassy can send them messages instantly. Uh, but uh, they don't have to do that. So we're guessing. And the guesses are in the range of 30,000. As, uh, as was said, there are higher ranges, 35,000, 40,000, even higher than that. But we don't know the exact number because we have no way uh, of knowing. Um, what was the other? The situation has become a, const a constraint. Oh, you know, I, I mean, we answered that already several days ago. Many times. <laughs> Can you elaborate that at all? No. And Michelle. Thanks. Uh, the International Energy Agency is saying that it looks like the entire oil industry could collapse in Venezuela. What, what's your view of that possibility, and how do you see that affecting the situation on the ground, including for the humanitarian situation? Well, I'm not sure what collapse means. There, there is certainly a steady drop in Venezuelan oil exports. Um, partly that reflects the blackout. But even if you take the blackout out of it, there is a very steady drop of maybe 50,000 barrels a month in, in production. So that um, they're heading down toward a million now, and you know, in a month or two, they'll be below a million. Uh, this is a country that used to export more than 3 million barrels a day. When do you think that, what did you say? They, they could be below? A couple of months. I think they're just above a million now. Again, um, yeah. they may have dipped below it because of the blackout, and they may come back 50 or 100,000 barrels. But that's the neighborhood they're in, and it is a steady decline. 
Um, it is true that you can do long-term damage if you don't maintain the infrastructure. <coughs> One of the reasons that in our announcement of PDVSA sanctions, we gave um, some American firms 180 days to transition out was precisely to avoid this kind of damage. Um, we, I think it's fair to say that the Maduro regime has been a very poor steward of the infrastructure in Venezuela. We see that in the electrical infrastructure, and we also see it in the oil infrastructure. Our sanctions had nothing to do with them coming down from 3 million barrels a day to a million barrels a day. Um, but it would certainly be better uh, from the point of view of democracy and human rights, and it would certainly be better from the point of view of the economy and the oil sector if the regime uh, were to come to an end. Last question, please, in the back there. From the Spanish Newswire F. Have you had any conversation lately with Vice President Arreaza? No. Uh, we had two conversations in, <coughs> God, I don't remember. One was in late January, one was uh, maybe a week after that. Um, and that, that uh, those were the, that was it. All right. Very good. Thank you. That's good. We'll call it there. All right. Thank you. Thank you.